Hi, thank you. This is a very different forum than what I'm used to with San Onofre. It's a much friendlier, and I, I wish we had something like this. We're trying to be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. So um, I've uh, been working, studying nuclear waste containment uh, for a number of years. I co-wrote a paper with Dr. Marvin Resnikoff on high burn-up fuel. Um, I've been working closely with material engineers, nuclear engineers, and nuclear physicists on these, on these issues. Uh, my background is as a systems analyst where I go into businesses or anything and I figure out how to solve problems. I never thought this is one of the problems I would be working on, but it's, it's self-survival here for everyone. Um, I, I was on a, a, a nuclear uh, workshop with Peter, made a presentation at the California Energy Commission, and uh, he invited me to come to this meeting and, and share my information. So I have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and I let do. me, may I introduce some context to okay. Ms. Gilmore's uh, inquiry. Uh, Ms. Donna Gilmore had done very early research at, on uh, the subject matter of uh, uh, chloride-induced uh, stress corrosion cracking of the multicast uh, uh, system. Ms. Gilmore's uh, research had led to increased public uh, focus uh, on this important subject matter and thank you very much for coming to our committee and providing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I guess I can clear. I, I don't do this much so I have to do. Okay, I have contact information and cards for people for any question. All the information I have to present, um, um, a website is sanitofreesafety.org. There's not one piece of information on there that doesn't have a government or scientific link. It's not, right, an, so it's not if, an opinion if, piece if site. If you submit that file to us, it can become part of our... Yeah, there, you already... He's it becomes it. part of our public record. Right, okay. okay. All right. Uh, one of the reasons I got involved, and this, this is Diablo Canyon, but um, uh, San Onofre was worse. This is statistics from the NRC for over eight and a half years of safety complaints from employees reporting to the NRC because their employer would not take care of safety concerns that the employee had at the plant. This session has to talk about the IFSI and Yes, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to do that. So. Okay, so so I'm just just saying why that we can't take everything at face value that we're told. That's the point of that. Okay, the game changer. I don't know if everybody's aware of, uh, but in 24 these these containers that we're using were designed for like 20 years. The NRC made a decision in 2014 that these can that these can stay on or may have to stay on site indefinitely. There's no Yucca Mountain. Uh, ho however. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go forward and, and okay. This is the Diablo Canyon. There's a circle where the dry storage is located, and this get, and it's it's really has a lot of ocean exposure. This slide wasn't shown earlier, um, uh, and and the the two year old. Uh, it's a closer up picture. Um, this is what the canisters look like. This is a BWR, not a PWR, but it's very similar. The, the canisters are only half inch thick. Uh, and that's the part that's susceptible to cracking, not only from a marine environment, but even critters crawling on and scratching the thing that makes stainless stainless. There's a number of causes. Now, the, uh, the, thin, the thin wall canister system uh, is the sealed canister, half inch. It goes inside this thick concrete overpack or cast, what, what wasn't on the side you saw earlier is the air vents. There are air vents in the concrete so that the air can cool, with convection cooling, can cool the canister. The air goes in the bottom and comes out the top. So because, of the, because it needs the air circulation, our, we're basically reliant on that half inch thick piece of stainless steel. And whether it's 304 stainless steel, 304L, 316, 316L, the NRC corrosion engineers say they are all susceptible to stress corrosion cracks from salt air. Would you buy a car that you could not inspect inside or out, cannot repair, cannot transport with cracks, cannot monitor to prevent leaks, or have any warning before something major happened? 
you know, would you buy that car? We don't need to think nuclear here. We just need to think, you know, basic safety requirements of anything. And there is no no, no earthquake rating for uh, cracking canisters. Partially cracked, there's an NRC regulation that requires canisters be intact without cracks before they can be transported. Not on the slide. Okay. Now, the EPRI study that was referred to uh, by Mr. Strickland, they, they found sufficient sea salts. This is, this is from a, a Department of Energy slide on that EPRI study. Um, they found sufficient sea salt, and they found temperatures low enough for moisture to stay on the surface of the canister, which can start the deliquescent process, they call it, kind of melting on the container. Now, I, I was invited to speak at the annual NRC uh, nuclear waste conference, and the, uh, there was the EPRI person was there also making a presentation. And I asked him, I said, what percent of the canister were you able to look at for the temperature and for corrosive particles on the surface? And he said about 10%. And I, I read the report the doc, that Mr. Strickland referred to, and the interpretation or the words that were there are that it is susceptible to, to, um, to cracking from a uh, chlorine environment. Now, this is the president of Holtec. He came and spoke to us a couple of times at San Onofre. He says it's not practical to prepare the canister. You will have in the face of millions of curies of radioactivity coming out of the cancer. So we think it's not a path forward. And he, he was at multiple sessions. He has, we have the video, of, you can watch the video of him stating this. So if you need to, if you even could find a way to repair the canister, and he says, you know, he's the one that warrants these things. He's saying they need to be replaced. If you remove that pool, you can't do that. Now, the NRC New Reg 1927 Revision 1 is the current aging management plan. And in that plan, if you have a crack that's 75% or greater, you have to take that canister out of service. How are they going to comply with that if they remove that pool? I agree with Pear, they need that pool for multiple reasons. Um, that right now we have 49 canisters at Diablo. That's not a picture of a Diablo can. I couldn't find one of a Diablo, so that's a new homes, but they're very similar. Uh, loading began eight years ago. The EPRI report, a two-year-old canister at Diablo has, they checked two canisters. And they checked it for salts and other uh, particles and took the temperature wherever they could reach by going through the air vents. And they found sufficient conditions in addition to the other conditions that are required to meet chloride-induced stress corrosion cracking, and it was, it was found to have them all. We do not know if it's cracking because they have no way to inspect for cracks. And I have a, a technical report that talks about all the alternative ways that you can look for cracks in, in, uh, uh, in vessels like this. And based on that, that document alone, it, it does not appear feasible to me that they're ever going to be able to do this with this particular design. And I, and I will share that uh, with this uh, committee. Um, the NRC has, in written documentation, was a meeting I participated in, where they said, once a crack starts, they don't know when it's going to start, they only know when they're susceptible. Once a crack is there, it can leak, it can go all the way through the wall in about 16 years. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, PG&E's plan, PG&E does know all this, and they, they're just going to, they're going to buy more of these, uh, containers and we're going to continue to create more waste. So this is this is the current plan and I have some recommendations I'll get to. Okay, and they do not have a plan to handle cracking or leaking canisters. Neither does San Onofre. Um, and he says, he mentioned they might want to destroy they might want to destroy the pools. Uh, a hot cell is the only other replacement option, but it's it's very expensive and it does not exist. Um, at the facility, and there are no plans to uh, build a hot cell facility. Uh, there's the NRC regulation where you can't transport cracking or leaking uh, uh, canisters. Um, and there was some, there's some confusion I want to clear up. The way the thin canister system works, um, and I don't remember your name, so one of you asked this question. The way the thin canisters work is the plan is to take the thin canister, put it inside a thick transport cast, ship it someplace else, 
and then take that same transport cask empty and bring it back to the facility here and pick up another one. The transport casks are meant to be reusable for the thin canister system. So they would not be using that transport cask for you know, ongoing storage. That's not the pur purpose of that, uh, that system. Does that, hopefully that makes sense to you. Uh, okay, the NRC approved these, these thin wall canisters by ignoring all aging issues. I have documentation showing that they assume nothing will go wrong in the first 20 years and they don't look at anything that might happen after 20 years when they approve this. When I told, told this to Commissioner Florio, he, he was shocked that that was even the case, okay? Um, so they really, the NRC by approving this has really put us in a big mess. Um, and uh, regarding high burn up fuel mentioned at the bottom there, um, high burn up fuel is being used at San Onofre. I'll wait till there. Okay, all right. Okay, the high burn of fuel is being used at Diablo, San Onofre, and most other plants. Um, and after, and um, Diablo Canyon has 13 damaged fuel assemblies as of 2013. They mentioned that they didn't can any of those, so I, I'm a little confused about that. That's from the DOE statistics they submitted, um, that uh, pg and &E submitted to, to them. Now, the interesting thing about high burn of fuel that a lot of people didn't know is that after dry storage, as the fuel cools down, it, it can damage the fuel cladding, the zirconium fuel count. Pierre and I had an email exchange on this. He wasn't aware of it at the time, but, but is now. You know, probably has to do with the, the number of factors. So we really, and so the NRC, when they were looking at approving the Holtec transport cast, they have some RAIs, requests for additional information, where they said, well, we don't want you shipping until you can verify that that high burnout fuel in dry storage has not become damaged. So that was in the NRC staff's concerns. Okay, now there's no early warning before uh, before leaking. What, the ideal thing is you want a, a warning system that alerts you before a leak, not after. And I'll show you other systems that can do that. They also do not do continuous radiation monitoring. The only requirement is somebody walks around with a monitor on a stick every quarter and checks the radiation level. So I'm not sure what PG&E is doing. Um, okay, yeah, and the thick casts have continuous monitoring that prevents leaks, not just finds leaks after they happen. Okay, so, and after the pools are emptied, um, they remove the radiation monitors, they eliminate emergency planning, these are NRC regulations, and then they actually allow fuel pools removed at Humboldt and Rancho Seco. Okay, this is our California situation. San Onofre, oldest 14 years, Rancho Seco 16, Humboldt, nine years, Diablo, eight. All of these are thin canister systems. The thing that's unique about Humboldt is they actually put each of those cans in a, a thick wall uh, transport cast, and it's being stored below ground, uh, or right below the surface, up, up right by the cliff. All right, I, in researching what's used in most of the world, the look to the, on the left, column you can see a safety feature that I think we would all want. And then on the right hand, there's, uh, there's uh, both a French and a German thick wall cast. There's a ductile cast iron that the German makes. It is now 19 and 3 quarter inches six. It, the, uh, it's not nine inches as, some, as he said earlier. So the, what the, the, the approved ones that we have in this country uh, that were approved by the NRC, they are 14 and a half inches thick. They're an older model and they're still in use here. They've been, these have been used in Germany over 40 years, so they're not just for, um, you know, reprocessing. Um, and and you, can, you can see from, and they keep them in, in concrete buildings for additional environmental and security protection. And they are a one for, they don't have cracking issues. And the French model, they're a, they're a, um, a kind of a carbon steel um, lead combination thing. So there's a lot more details in thick or thin that makes one better than the other. So, so these are just some attributes, but I, I recommend that the, um, this committee look more deeply into this option 
And if, you, if we want something that can be transported, if we want to give our stuff to somebody else, let's at least put it in the best available technology and we're, we're not using that now and we're risking we're risking all of us here they, they those don't have cracking issues they can you can get right next to them they have uh, double metal seals with continuous uh, pressure monitoring so if they need to replace that metal seal they're designed to be uh, maintainable basically you get a you get a crack in the thin one you're done we don't even know they have cracks we'll only know after they leak once every quarter I guess we'll know this is the Fukushima cast. These were thin wall casts made by Arriva, TN series. Um, they survived the earthquake and the, and the tsunami at, at Fukushima. They inspected the, by the way, they, ins they opened these up to see how well the insides held up. And what they learned was the, the fuel baskets, that grid pattern basket you see that holds each fuel assembly. They determined that those aluminum alloy baskets were not going to last longer than 60 years. And they have banned the use of aluminum baskets. We are using aluminum baskets, but we have no idea how they're performing because they're sealed in a, in a metal, non-reusable um, thin wall canister. And, and somebody mentioned early that you can open these up and inspect them. Well, then, then you've just, you've spent millions of dollars because they're not designed to be opened and then used again. And there, as far as I know, not one single thin wall canister has ever been opened in a pool. Are you, a, I don't know if you're aware, Pear, I'm not aware of any that have actually ever been opened after they're loaded with fuel. Idaho has some of the older ones in storage, and they've been monitoring and opening and inspecting them. The thick wall or the thin ones? No, the thin wall. The, the, but they're, they're really old. The Idaho National Lab yeah, I would be interested oldest, in, uh, did the they old. do that in a hot cell or a pool? No, they've got a pool there. OK, I would like to talk to you some t later about that. This uh, is Ms. how they Gilmore, do Ms. Gilmore, may I ask you, how much more time do you need for your presentation? Maybe 15 minutes? Uh, may we offer you a uh, time slot in the afternoon session as we have okay. well, another let me, okay. speaker. Well, let me just skip through some of this. Um, okay, this this is a high burn up fuel. It, this is these are data points on actual pieces of high burn up fuel. This is not experimental data, and it shows the oxide thickness on the on the cladding, which can lead to hydride development, which raises a concern if we're going to have hydrides building up in these canisters and is it okay to actually put it back in water or do we need a hot cell? So I'll just raise that as a issue. I won't go into the misloading at Diablo. The license expires in 2014 so we have an opportunity to do something before this expiration. Um, and I'm not going to, so I've got some recommendations here. But I want to mention the transport cast for Holtec is, is um, 204, meter, 204 metric tons, or 225 tons. It is not 125 tons. The high burn up, high star 190. So that, that was in incorrect information. Um, the, the Coastal Commission requires transport, transportability. And right now, we have none. So that that's an issue. And I think I can just quickly. Well, Ms. Ms. Gilmore, Ms. Gilmore, I I, I did not it. mean to interrupt your presentation. Okay, I'm done. No, no, we, we certainly welcome your presentation in two parts. You know, in the afternoon session. Well, that, I think not. that's the majority of the information I have. And if you have any questions, I'll give you cards and and that. So, oh, thank you okay. very much for your accommodation. I did not mean to interrupt you. No, that's you. fine. I have yeah. pretty much everything covered. Is this and and as I said, if if we can get the the computer file, then it'll go into our records, and, and that becomes publicly available to anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which I assume you accept. Well, uh, of course. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not. Uh, not yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Would you have time in a, in our afternoon session to continue a discussion? No. I, one more thing: a, an approved transport cask does not mean you can move a canister. There are additional requirements that the NRC has. Mm -hmm. Or the canister before it can move. So it's I just understand. not, a, yeah. And they have it in their little book. Yeah, we understand that. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Gilmore, for your presentation.